So yeah, hello everyone. Uh, I would like to talk about uh, recent addition of ticking speed locks into Zephyr and uh, the initial reasons for all of that. I'm Eugenie Palcev. Uh, I've, I've been working on various uh, pieces of system software for Arc Synopsis architecture and recently uh, for RISC-V architecture as well. All this mostly based on open source projects like Linux kernel, Ubuntu, and some other projects. And after some time, I became the maintainer of uh, Arc uh, process architecture in Zephyr TOS. So I spent a significant amount of time uh, making it uh, better for Arc and for others. And thus, uh, I've seen a lot of interesting stuff happening there. And one of them, one of them we are going to discuss right now. But first, uh, it's a mandatory cue to funny picture. Here it is. So, a few words about the initial reason why we started to dig into this topic and how it's related to Zephyr at all. Some time ago, I was involved in bringing up of our processors with a new ArcV3 architecture, which uh, have up to 12 processor cores. And uh, for this system level testing, we needed something which is uh, SMP capable, which allows us to load sy system significantly and uh, stress test it with some, with a lot of intercore communication and all this stuff. One potential candidate here is Linux kernel, but uh, it's always challenging to debug issues in Linux, especially if you expect what you might have some hardware issues just because you are just being up in the prototype. And uh, Linux is too huge, it's too um, complicated to debug, so for the first steps, we wanted to have something simpler than Linux. And actually, Zephyr is a great candidate for, he, for this. It has SMP support, uh, which was added in uh, uh, 1.11 kernel version, and it has matured since then. It has POSIX subsystem, which allows us to run existing uh, benchmarks and stress tests without uh, or with minimal changes. And we were planning to support Zephyr anyway. So it's not like we are doing some work which we'll, we are going to throw away after that. So it, it's definitely good. And of course, Zephyr is definitely simpler than Linux kernel, at least for now. Uh, at that time, our hardware was not ready, so as usual, initially tests were prepared and run in simulation. In our case, we were using Synopsys uh, and Sim for that. It's our simulator. And such things rarely go smoothly in the beginning. Uh, among the other things, we were bumping into the issue what some of our stress tests were failing. And in the situation when you have a lot of uh, uh, in the installation, when you have a new process architecture, you have a lot of things uh, which may go wrong. And the issue can be in lots of places. We may have some flaws in SMP implementation for our architecture easily. Uh, it could be some SMP-related uh, issue in POSIX subsystem. We've already bumped into several ones, so it could be yet another one. It could be issue with uh, the stress test itself. It could be issue with some of our tools, like in toolchain or in simulator. So, lots of things uh, we can blame here. And after a portion of debugging, we found uh, what uh, we have a spy, uh, we bump into life log, and it was possible due to the combination of how our simulation works and how Zephyr spin logs are implemented. Obviously, you can just say, oh, it's just uh, the way how, how our simulation works. Let's just forget about it every time we have something failing on our uh, testing environment. Otherwise, even in base possible scenario, you will end up debugging the stuff on hardware, which would be uh, significantly more challenging. And uh, life logs, it sounds uh, pretty suspicious. Are we the only one who were bumping into such, fi such things? And the answer is no. At the, at the same mom, moment, a uh, different team from different company was investigated similar issue with Zephyr, but in their case, it was a hardware platform with RISC-V. 
we discussed uh, our findings with them, and in the results, we ended in addition of uh, spin-lock fairness test and addition of alternate spin-lock implementation to Zephyr. But what was the issue what it cost after all? To understand that, we firstly need to talk about how spin-locks are implemented in Zephyr. Spin-locks were added uh, to Zephyr uh, with the introduction of SMP support in it. It was uh, done in 1.11 uh, uh, version, and the algorithm itself uh, uh, wasn't uh, really changed since then. Here, here are some keys where really simplified Zephyr spin-lock code. In real code, we are doing lots of other useful stuff. For example, we check for spin-lock owner to detect situations when we unlock it from unexpected thread or unexpected core. We, check, we might check for the time we spent in this uh, lock uh, when it was held. And uh, we are not, not simply looping, uh, but uh, we call some special uh, uh, spin relax function so we can still process uh, uh, remote function call from other cores uh, uh, and potentially doing some power saving stuff. So it's actually a bit more complex, but he is bare minimum. Uh, so initially, spin lock was just uh, one atomic variable which was used as a flag. In case of lock function, we uh, turn interrupt off on this core, uh, so the code which is uh, protected by spin lock won't be won't be uh, uh, rescheduled uh, and uh, preempted by some other code. And after that, we uh, try to uh, set this uh, atomic flag if it's not yet set. And in a log function, we do it in the opposite order. We clear the flag, and after that, we turn on interrupts. It's uh, pretty simple, uh, but uh, there is no guarantee, fairness guarantee at all. For example, if multiple cores trying to paint uh, for spin lock at the same time, there is no guarantee one, that one specific core will get this spin lock at any time if there is always someone pending. Uh, we can lock and unlock it uh, on one core, one on other cores, but never uh, get it on some other core. And now a few words about our simulation. Uh, our simulator can uh, uh, simulate multi-core processor, and in that case, it just uh, run uh, and execute uh, blocks of instructions from each core uh, in single uh, simulation thread. So we ex execute a block of instruction from core zero, after that from core one, two, three, and after that uh, again from core zero, one, two, three, and so on. Uh, and simulation is uh, deterministic as uh, number of instruction in that uh, code block is uh, fixed and there is no external events or interrupts as uh, in, in this case there were no peripheral in the model we were using just because we will bring up in the core stuff. We don't need this peripheral stuff. So, what was the issue we were bumping into? We had uh, one uh, spin lock which we accessed in from multiple cores. It could be some spin lock in our application, like uh, uh, any spin lock, but in, uh, in the issue we bumped into, it was just a scheduled uh, spin lock from the Zephyr itself. Uh, spin lock was locked and unlocked multiple times when uh, we execute instruction from one core. But uh, we were always switching to the next core block of instruction when the spin lock was taken. It was just unlucky coincidence, like uh, test was executing uh, uh, stuff in a loop, and uh, the size uh, of this loop uh, interfered with uh, the uh, uh, block instruction block size in the simulator itself. So other cores were not able to grab a spin lock at all. It was, uh, and it was scalar spin lock. You can imagine what it uh, affect the system behavior significantly, just because uh, you are trying to get this scalar spin lock and you are not able to grab it at all. And it's not reproduced stably, just because minor code changes may with mask this issue. We may uh, like increase or decrease the uh, number of instruction in this loop, so. It won't be produced anymore just because uh, eventually uh, the code would be able to 
the core would be able to grab this silver spin lock and uh, test, test would succeed. So that's why it would be nice to have uh, some test to reproduce it uh, in a stable way. And now we have such test in Zephyr test suite. It's uh, additional test case in a kernel spin lock test. So how this test is done? We just have one spin lock. Uh, we grab it, uh, hold it for some time, and release it. And we do it in a loop for on all of, the, all of uh, available cores. We need to hold it for some time just because we need to simulate the, the situation when multiple cores uh, are pending uh, for this spin lock in a loop. And also we are collecting per core statistics uh, of number of times spin lock was acquired on this exactly core, just to be able to judge if everything is going okay or not. So we have uh, the test, so let's run it on our simulator on NSIM. We have used, modi uh, in uh, this example, we have used modified uh, NCIM HS SMP config. It's, uh, uh, it was just bumping number of cores to four. And uh, where are results? As uh, some cores uh, were like more lucky, some cores were less lucky, uh, as expected. But uh, what would happen if we run it on real hardware? For that, uh, let's just take this uh, HDK board, which has uh, four ARCV2 cores, and run it on, run test on it. Unlike NSIM, unlike our simulator, hardware execute uh, all the stuff in parallel here, just because there's four physical cores. So probably we'll get such ideal results when everything is uh, completely fair. Or at least it would be probably close to these ideal results like this. Well, there's uh, actual results. Uh, one core took uh, almost all spin logs and all other cores were starved. And it's pretty interesting results, but uh, could we expect it uh, from the beginning? So let's have a look uh, at, on what was happening. Firstly, let's uh, again take a look uh, on how log function is implemented. We have uh, atomic uh, read modified write uh, cats primitive. It uh, stands for compare and swap. Sometimes it's also named compare and exchange. So if I use uh, another name, don't be confused with it. Uh, it can be implemented, this primitive can be implemented in multiple ways, uh, but it requires some hardware support. For example, some atomic instructions. Uh, in this case, we are, we are just using uh, the API provided by Zephyr itself. So we access locked variable in a loop. This uh, locked variable the like internals of the spin lock itself. Uh, and we do it from multiple cores simultaneously. And uh, now we need to take a look on uh, our hardware. Uh, in our processor, we have a private uh, level one data, data cache. Uh, so uh, it's quite common design to, uh, it's quite common to have it so on multiple uh, uh, socks. So it's not something unusual. But in the results, uh, the core which own cache line with the locked variable has more chances to this compare exchange uh, primitive to succeed. So if uh, some core uh, get it once, it's more likely to uh, get spin lock next time. Uh, how we can, we can avoid such thing? Uh, one, of, one possible way is uh, just to use another spin lock uh, algorithm with the uh, fairness guarantee. For example, it could be a ticket spin lock. It's not something new. For example, it was added in Linux kernel a lot of time ago, a lot of years ago. So let's uh, take a look uh, how it's implemented. It's, as it was done previously, uh, we turn interrupts off in log function and turn them on in unlock function. This part haven't changed at all. 
in case of ticket spin lock, uh, now we have two atomic variables. One uh, for ticket pointer, another for owner pointer. So in the left part with uh, uh, diagram, so we'll show how we multiple cores would be try to take this spin lock and what internal states we will have. This core uh, just marked this, started with number two uh, instead of zero, just uh, to not to be confused with owner number. This owner doesn't relate to CPU ID at all, it's just completely different numbers. So, uh, core two uh, try to uh, get spin lock. It uh, increment uh, this uh, ticket, uh, ticket uh, variable and it uh, stores a uh, local copy of uh, old, old uh, value of this variable intern internally. And uh, after that, we try to check the condition. If the uh, owner is same as ticket, if the owner is same as all val value of ticket, uh, we'll get, uh, uh, we can get this spin log. And in this case, uh, previously, uh, it, oh, ticket was zero, owner was zero, so Core two get the spin lock and hold it for some time. After some time, uh, core three also want to grab the spin lock. Mm. It's same go to the spin lock function, uh, increment this uh, global ticket, so it now would be two, and hold the previous ticket value locally, and this previous value would be one. And now it waits uh, for the condition. Uh, what owner would be equal to the old ticket value. But we haven't modified owner just because it would be modified in a lock unlock function which, which, we haven't uh, which we haven't called from the CPU to. Uh, now another core try to uh, lock this same spin lock. It would have ticket uh, value two and it would be wait wait waiting till owner would be able, would, till owner would be equal to So, and now we have something, something interesting. Uh, core 2 uh, decided to uh, release this spin lock. Uh, it's uh, going to this uh, unlock function and increment this owner value. And uh, now there's potential to uh, threads which can uh, grab this spin lock. In previous uh, spin lock implementation, there was no guarantee if it is would be core two, core three or core four because uh, they are both spinning in one variable and who was lucky uh, when he gets spin lock. In this case, uh, it uh, has deterministic behavior. So because core three is waiting for uh, owner value to be one and core four is waiting to, for owner value to be two. Now we have corner, now we have owner value to be owner value one, so only core three can now take spin lock. So it's take it, after that it's release it, and we increment this owner uh, to two, and now core four can finally lock its spin lock. After some time we have uh, this uh, uh, spin lock unlocked, so again, uh, both owner and ticket would be in the same, uh, would have same value. And it's, uh, would be incremented, uh, after that, uh, when we, someone would try to lock it again, and after some time, uh, this value would be uh, wrap around, but there is no issue just because it's uh, totally fine by this algorithm. So, uh, we, now we have uh, uh, ticket spin lock implementation, and let's run our test with ticket spin lock implementation. Firstly, on NSIM. And as we can see, it works nicely. Everything is completely fair. So let's try it on hardware platform, platform on this HDK board. It's also completely fair. According to our tests, it's just nice. So let's try, uh, run it on something else. For example, on Kimu. We have modified, uh, we have used uh, modified uh, Kimu Cortex-A53 SMP config. We just bump number of cores to four to be same number as with other tests. So for now everything is okay. It's fair, but uh, what would happen if our host is a bit busy? For example, 
you may feel urge to backup diff random into diff, diff null, and you want to do it in multiple uh, threads. So here's a simple bash script to, uh, to do that, which allows us to nicely load the system. So all the cores except uh, two would be uh, running this uh, copying of diff random into diff null. And here's a screenshot from top, so everything is uh, pretty loaded. So let's run it, uh, let's rerun test on Kimu. And now we have some issues. Uh, results are not, are not perfect anymore. But what happens here? Have we have some flow in uh, spin lock implementation itself? Let's, uh, let's check. We launch uh, Kimo uh, with SMP uh, option. It's uh, SMP uh, CPUs and number of CPUs. So it spawns multiple threads. Uh, it would be a thread uh, for each core. So in case of we have uh, four uh, cores in Zephyr, we will have uh, four threads in the host, which would be representing each core. So in ideal situation, we will have a Zephyr test thread running on some host core. But uh, if we have a uh, uh, high load on the host, KMO uh, threads would, would be more likely to schedule it out. And it would be happen on different amount of different uh, time moments. So as it was shown here. So if Zephyr thread requests spin lock, it uh, still get, uh, get it in proper order. The algorithm it itself is okay, but the issue is in, in, in other place. Uh, we, Zephyr, Zephyr thread, which uh, would be requesting this uh, spin lock, may not request it as Kimo thread was not running at all, just because of it was scheduled out on a host. So this thing is uh, obviously not, cannot be fixed with ticket spin lock. So we improved the situation with uh, spinlock fairness, at least on some, some, of, uh, some of the platforms. Do we have any drawbacks uh, with ticket spinlock? Uh, first thing which comes to mind is uh, slowdown. Uh, spinlock is the part of a code which is uh, used often enough. Often enough, we have uh, more logic uh, in spinlock function. So have we made? Uh, some noticeable impact on the system performance. But let's firstly compare how our old uh, and ticket uh, spin lock implementation uh, was done. So in case of uh, uh, new implementation in the uh, spin lock function, we have plus one atomic get uh, Zephyr primitive, which would be result in one memory read and two memory barriers. In case of Zephyr, it would be uh, full memory barriers. And in case of case spin unlock, it would be uh, atomic uh, read modify write instead of regular write. Number of, uh, now number of barriers would be same just because we are replacing one primitive, atomic primitive with, with another. Uh, so it uh, doesn't seem to be really a uh, big change. Uh, and uh, in terms of how we access the global variable, there's also no real difference. In both implementations, we just spin against global atomic variable, and we are trying to do read modified write access uh, uh, from it, to it from the loop, from the spin lock loop. But uh, in real system, uh, it may have some impact depending on the architecture, because uh, this uh, Atomic implementation and barrier, uh, barrier stuff uh, would be uh, significantly, have significantly different impact on different architectures. So in case of ARC, we don't have uh, something serious. But uh, there's another thing uh, in this alternative spin lock implementation which may concern us. We are two independent atomic variables now. And is there a chance what they may unsynchronize on some point? Everything would be fine if we just have a lock and unlock function. But we also have a key spin try lock function, which try to uh, lock spin lock if it is available and uh, do not spin if it is not, not available. And it has tiny window where we have, uh, we, we may 
have potential uh, issues. When the window is between atomic get and atomic uh, compare and swap uh, primitive, it was marked with a this arrow. Mm. Uh, it's just uh, several assembler instructions uh, uh, where we need to atomic variable to wrap around to have some issues. So what may what we what we may do wrong uh, while executing these uh, several assembler instructions? For example, we can we may try to lock uh, uh, lock uh, call lock function with a huge amount of times is almost uh, uint uh, 32 max value plus, plus something. But uh, as uh, we have uh, lock function blocking, it would require us to have this huge amount of number of cores in the system. So obviously it's not the case, especially in case of Zephyr. Another thing, uh, uh, we may lock, uh, ah, another option is, uh, to grab and release uh, spin lock uh, with, uh, again, huge amount of time from other cores. And after that, to lock it again. If, uh, if we can do that, uh, uh, we can uh, close the wrap wraparound. But it needs to be done while we executing just several assembler instructions in the context with uh, locked interrupts. So we cannot uh, jump to interrupt, we no cannot uh, reschedule. So it's not really possible for our Arc Zephyr port. To meet, to meet such conditions, we need uh, CPU core just to hang, which would, uh, would be much uh, a problematic issue if we just have a CPU cores hanging. Uh, so we've talked about uh, why it won't happen, but let's talk about why it may happen. Potentially, we may run Zephyr on top of some other software. For example, in case of Risk Five, it could be machine mode software if we implemented Risk Five Zephyr port, which would be running in the supervisor mode and not in machine mode like it's done right now. Or we may run Zephyr in virtualization on top of some hypervisor. So. Now we can imagine uh, some specific use cases which don't uh, require our hardware to be broken to have uh, to bump into this issue we were talking about uh, previously about wraparound. So, uh, how we can fix that? We may uh, actually there's uh, multiple uh, possibilities. We can use double atomic instructions to access both variables simultaneously. So it will be just one atomic access. But uh, we don't have such API in Zephyr, and most likely not all the architectures uh, which uh, support SAP in Zephyr has such, such instructions in hardware. Uh, another option would be to store a ticket and owner in halves of one atomic variable. So it would be 16 bit for one uh, for the ticket and 60 bit for the owner. It would be easier, however, it won't. It won't, we won't be able to use uh, existing atomic increment primitives. We need to implement something on which is based on this compare and, ex, compare and swap primitive. So it's, can, it's definitely possible, but for now it's not yet implemented in Zephyr. So uh, we've discussed uh, speed ticket spin logs, uh, their advantages and drawbacks. They are available in recent uh, releases, however, uh, we are marked as experimental feature, so it's not enabled by default. So you can use them wisely, and if you have any questions about it, uh, we have some time to ask. Wait, wait. I don't know if it's turned on or maybe it got too far for the transmitter. The, the intent of the experimental feature, obviously, is going to mature over time and that eventually will turn it off. Um, I, it's been a while. It sounds like you've got it running on hardware reliably, like you're running the full Zephyr test suite and 
in that on that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I guess I, I guess my input would just be I mean I, I think it's time if, if if you guys are willing to say hey you know we've got this this suite and it's been running on this platform in our rig or or whatever, um, you know the, the the intent was always that it it be turned off and that we start we start using this more broadly and then then we would move it to like this or that you know emulation platform would be running it all the time. And, and well, like actually, that. we already have it enabled for our platforms for our uh, platforms and. We have it enabled for one of the Kimu Risk Five platform, uh, so it would be uh, tested in the Zephyr uh, upstream CI. And uh, generally, uh, it would be a good idea to have it enabled uh, for other platforms. But again, we need to be careful just because uh, there are some potential uh, issues with suite implementation if we are running in some virtualization. Uh, uh, Right. Yeah. You, exactly. We would. We wouldn't. We wouldn't move away from a default spin lock for a while. But I mean, again, the next step after experimental is, you know, a, an available option. Yeah. Pr probably as we are currently uh, doing a lot of stuff with Risk Five as well. Uh, at some time, we are going to implement this S mode uh, port of uh, Risk Five in Zephyr, and for that, it would be probably one uh, one point in checklist to have this uh, spin lock implementation updated to don't have so we won't have this uh, potential issue at all just because uh, there are already implementation in some other projects after we found it so we can use it as well sounds good and, and the other question was going to be are you aware of any progress uh, actually localizing the original live lock that was reported. I, I, it, <laughs> I'm just interested personally. Obviously, I was a big thorn in this, you know, saying that, like, look, I mean, I, you know, the, the, the scheduler lock just doesn't have that. The, you know, critical sections are all small. I can't see any circumstance where you would then, you know, get stuck in a in a dueling lock where, where once one, one party was unable to progress. I don't know if there's a... Uh, yeah, actually, I've uh, mentioned about it, and, uh, yeah, let me... Let's just open the proper slide. Uh, so yeah, the initial life lock issue was uh, mm, due to how uh, our mm, it's not the thing I was showing. Oh, it was it was purely the the the, the simulator thing. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Okay. But the number of blocks that then determinizes the order in which the locks are taken. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. It's a pure simulation. It's just because uh, we are not uh, doing it in parallel. We are doing just it by bunching extra ex instruction. And as it was deterministic, uh, if we get this uh, situation, what we are always graph the lock, and after that simulation would be uh, taking a bunch of instruction from another core. The other code would be seen as uh, this spin lock is always taken. Okay. So it's uh, yeah, it. it was mostly uh, due to how uh, our simulator work. That's actually a question on on YouTube, so I'm gonna I'm gonna read it. Uh, it's from Wilfried. And Wilfried is asking, some platforms don't support cross-core atomic operations, like the RP2040. Would uh, Ticket Spin Lock be portable to such platform requiring SOC-specific primitives, uh, for example, using hardware spin lock? Hmm. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, and uh, probably to answer that, I need to check how the hardware spin lock are implemented. But uh, generally, if uh, even the original spin lock implementation required to have this atomic uh, read modify write uh, variables. So I'm not sure if uh, if and how this original spin lock was implemented for them. But uh, if they use uh, some other things instead of this uh, read modify write atomic uh, instruction, probably it could be a way somehow to implement it, but I need to check this hardware specific firstly. Yeah, the, it's, we, it's really have a lot of uh, influence on how we can or cannot implement it. 
Right. We had a driver submitted a while back that was a hardware spin lock. And, and in that case, the hardware actually managed the fairness management. That you didn't need a ticket spin lock because the, the operations at the hardware level were like lock and unlock, and it would it would it would handle that all for you. Yeah, but, that's true, but, but uh, different hardware. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's true, but there's no information if the hardware maintain this uh, fairness or not, and if it's not. Uh, when some, probably they want somehow to work around it. So I think there is actually uh, another question to that person. So I don't really understand if true SMP system could be implemented with uh, such a memory approach. Because uh, if there is no uh, coherence between cores, uh, so how that could be even possible, and that question then makes no sense. Because all of uh, what uh, we had in that presentation it is related to SMP pro uh, system only. Because in AMP system, there will be another way of synchronization things. And on single core system, there is no problem at all. So it is kind of a question without or taken out of the context. So yeah, I didn't know. Typically, those kind of uh, things which we are seeing here, they are implemented on top of the, um, the cache, uh, ca cache coherency protocols. And so if you don't have cache coherency, there is no uh, such, such kind of primitive at all. Possibly. Yeah, I've seen these hacks for ex uh, extensor, but I never actually investigated how it's done for them, just because luckily we don't have such a uh, requirement. All right, we still have time for a few more questions, if there are any. Not on YouTube, not in the room. All right, thank you. <laughs>